Welcome to Trinity Church. Let's experience his presence today. We serve a good God who is rich in love for us and he's worthy of our praise. Why don't you join us? been so good to us. He's good in every way, every season, every time, no Amen. matter the circumstance, he remains the same. He is good. He has not stopped being good. That's right. He saved us because he's good. It's in his nature. Gracious and 
slow to anger he is rich in love he is good to
Hallelujah. My goodness is apart from you, nothing, Lord. There is nothing good in me but you. Thank you so much for your, your life in me, Lord, your goodness in me, in us, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for being the good in us. We honor you today. We worship you. Well, we can testify that God is good today. Hallelujah. He is so faithful and true and kind and merciful and forgiving, loving toward us. And we are his children. We are the sheep of his pasture. And we are the beneficiaries of his blessings. How good the Lord is. And we're so glad you could join us for this Sunday morning worship service. Say, last Sunday, I shared with you an urgent need in Kenya, Africa. The pastor there that we've been supporting many years, Bernard Ondiak, had told us about terrible flooding that occurred, and it left 15,000 people homeless without food and shelter, and so we just mentioned it, and I am so pleased to tell you that you responded amazingly. Over $4,000 was given almost overnight. In fact, we were able to wire the money to them the very next day. Our treasurer, Mark Summers, thanks to his competent work, pulled the money together and got it wired off from our bank straight to Kenya. And just within a day or so, I got pictures back from Bernard Ondiek. And you may be seeing them on your screen right now of the food uh, relief effort, the Food is being put into the hands of needy people, and they are so thankful. When I shared with Pastor Bernard that we were sending that money, he was absolutely overjoyed that they were able to help people instead of having to turn them away. And so we want to thank you. God bless you for your faithfulness in giving in our time of need. And that's the amazing thing. We're going through a crisis here in this country, and yet... You are reaching halfway around the world to touch people who are hurting more than we are. God bless you for that. And thank you for your faithful giving week in and week out to Trinity Church. Your tithes and offerings are so appreciated, and because of them, we're able to continue the ministry here. And so we're going to give you just a moment to prepare your offering. And uh, you can give so many different ways through our online giving from our website, which is trinitycolumbia.com. And then our new church app, you can do it there as well. And, of course, you can mail a check to P.O. Box 9325, Columbia, 29290. And we even have people that just bring it by. Our office is open Monday through Friday, so you're welcome to bring it by and say hello to us while you do that. Thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Well, you might notice that Sandra has an extra big smile on her face today. Being Mother's Day, she is so happy because we have our kids and grandkids visiting us from Florida. And you'll be seeing some of them in a little bit, maybe up here on this stage while Pastor Jennifer brings the Mother's Day message. We're looking forward to that word from the Lord through her today. But I've asked Sandra to pray a blessing over our offering and also a blessing over all of the mothers. We can't tell you how much you mean to us. We wouldn't be here without you, would we? But more than that, you bless our lives in so many ways. And we just want to say thank you from the bottom of our hearts. So I've asked her to pray our blessing today. Father, we just want to say thank you. From the bottom of our hearts, you are a good God. You are a good Father. And you've been so good to us. You gave your only son, Jesus, to die for my sin, for the sins of the world. Thank you, Lord, that you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider, and that you have met our needs, Lord. And we owe our thanksgiving to you. Your word says for us to bring our tithes and offerings into the storehouse. And that's what we want to do at this time, Lord. 
even if we don't have everything that we want, we are so blessed. So we offer our tithes and our offerings to you today, Jesus. We give them to you in obedience to your word. And Lord, we pray blessings on every woman who is a mother. Thank you for the gift of our mothers and many of us. Our mothers are in heaven today. And we look forward to the time that we will be reunited. And Lord, I want to pray for the women who don't have children of their own. And their hearts may be heavy today. I've been there, Lord, for a lot of years. We didn't have a child. And I know how difficult it can be. So I pray blessings on them today too, Lord. And I pray, pray blessings on every mother and every woman that has been a role model to us. Just wrap your loving arms around them today. In Jesus' name, we love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you so much, Sandra, and thank you for your giving. And we are so pleased to have Pastor Jennifer come. She is a mother of four, and uh, she's well qualified to speak to mothers on Mother's Day. So let's welcome her to the pulpit, if you will. Well, good morning and happy Mother's Day. I thought it might be appropriate for me to bring a couple of things up here with me this morning. A little plate and a cup and some silverware. We're going to set a little table right here. Thank you. And I'm going to pull up a chair at the table. Well, they say that when you're about five years old, you think that your mom knows everything. When you're 15, you think that your mom knows nothing. When you're 25, you wonder what your mom thinks. When you're 35, you call her to ask her what she thinks. And of course, the older you get, then you start to wish that you could ask her what she thinks. Well, aren't we blessed to have such a wonderful spiritual mother Amen. at our church like Miss Sandra? Um, she's mothered many people in this church body. We're so grateful and I'm so grateful for my mother. What a wonderful thing to have a godly mother. And if you have that, make sure you take a moment today to thank the Lord for it. It's just a, it's a blessing that not everyone has. And if you have it, it's something to give thanks for. So three out of my four children are with me at home right now since we've been doing this different kind of schedule where we're sheltering in place and so three out of my four kids are at home with me. That means there have been a lot of meals prepared over these last, you know, six, eight weeks. A lot of mouths to feed. Some of you can relate. Um, some of you are preparing to fix a meal for your family tomorrow. And the number one question in my house is, what's for lunch? And then after that, it's, what's for dinner? And then it's not only what is for lunch, what's for dinner, it's what are we going to eat? What are we going to have? And then someone usually has an opinion about that, what we're going to have, what we're going to eat, right? A lot of opinions, a lot of appetites, a lot of people to please in our preparation and in, in who we have to feed. Um, moms, you may remember what it was like to wake up several times during the night with a hungry baby. And you're the one responsible for feeding that baby. That's the way God made it, is that when we're born into this world, we're completely dependent upon our mom to be fed, to survive. We can't do it by ourselves. But then you know when that baby starts to grow and become a toddler, the more they grow, the more they develop, the more independent they want to be, right? And they want to feed themselves. They want to hold the fork. They want to hold it. And it might be a mess, but they want to do it by themselves. Again, that's how the Lord made us. He made us to go from being completely dependent 
And then there's a process of independence. And that's a good thing, right? And so eventually our kids, that happy day comes where you can say to your child, go make yourself some food. You can say, there's food in the pantry. There's food in the refrigerator. You go eat. You go figure it out. Fend for yourself. You can have whatever's in there. Make yourself a snack. That's such a happy day when they can do that for themselves and you don't have to do every single thing for them. And then, of course, after that comes the time when they leave you. They leave your home and now they're responsible for buying their own food and making their own food and eating their own food. And as parents, you don't get a say anymore, do you? You don't get to tell them what to buy. They're going to go and they're going to eat what they want. And what you hope is that you taught them well enough that they make some good choices about what to eat, right? You guys can see how I'm about to turn this into a spiritual thing, can't you? We're talking about food, but, you know, we're fixing to take it in that spiritual direction. You're hoping you have created the right appetites in your children, right? So that when they leave you, they don't blow it and eat nothing but junk food and chips. That they, they actually know how to eat a salad every once in a while, a vegetable, right? And you hope that, but the truth is you no longer control that. They will control that. And some of us will have to just sort of sit back and watch what they choose to eat, what they choose to consume. Now, taking it into that spiritual application, the, you know, the thing about food is I love to eat. So for me, eating has never been a chore. It's never been a real hardship for me to eat. I look forward to it. And, of course, we have to eat. We have no choice. Eating's not optional, is it? We must eat. And so I've always thought, well, since we must eat, I must enjoy it. And so I not only look forward to eating, but, you know, again, that's the way God made us. We have to have food, and he actually created us to enjoy the food. And then when you look in the Bible, you see so many metaphors and comparisons to our spiritual life with our physical life and so many comparisons to our physical diet and our spiritual diet, right? There are a lot of comparisons and, and Jesus even called himself the bread of life, right? And the living water. So today I want to talk a little bit about our appetites, what we eat, and what we feed other people. Now whether you're a mother, father, grandparent, caregiver, you're going to be responsible at some point, not only for feeding yourself, but for feeding others. And that's what I want us to talk about this morning. And I want to start by taking another look at this story from John, where Jesus encounters a woman at the well. And instead of reading it this morning, I just kind of want to tell it to you, because I want to point out a couple of things that maybe you haven't seen before. And the gist of it is this. Jesus and his disciples go through this town called Samaria. And it's not a town anyone really wants to go to, yet they go. And the disciples go on into town and they decide they're going to find some food for everyone to eat. So while they go on into the town, Jesus makes a pit stop at a well outside of town. And while Jesus is there, a woman comes to draw water from that well. And she's a Samaritan woman. Now, Jesus strikes up a conversation with this lady. And in the course of their conversation, he says, I'm thirsty. Would you give me something to drink? Well, Jesus ends up saying to her, if you knew who you were talking to here, you would be the one asking me for something to drink. And so Jesus starts to kind of twist this idea of this actual water that the woman's coming to get, and he starts sort of making it into a spiritual thing. But she doesn't get it at first. She doesn't really understand what he's talking about. 
And he says, you know, if you knew who you were talking to, and if you knew the wonderful gift of God that God had for you, you would be asking me for water. Because I have this kind of water that if you drink it, you will never thirst again. And she sort of takes it literally, and she's like, what kind of water is this that you're talking about? I really want some of that water. And so Jesus goes on to tell that woman all kinds of things that he could not possibly have known, personal things about her life, about her former relationships and husbands, and about how right now she's living with someone who's not her husband. He starts telling her all of these things. And, of course, she says, well, I think you must be a prophet. As soon as she realizes she's talking to a pastor, a holy person, she brings up the stuff that she has questions about. And it's like, why do you guys do this? Why do you believe this? Well, you believe this, but we believe this. Have you ever been in that kind of situation with someone? As soon as they find out you're a Christian, as soon as they find out you attend Trinity Church, as soon as they figure out you're a pastor, it happens all the time. The first thing on people's mind is to bring up something that's a little bit controversial or that brings division, right? They want to ask you about some kind of hot topic in our culture. Well, what do you think about this? And really, they're looking to see what side are you on so that I can figure out what side I'm on because we're probably against each other. People are always looking for the conflict, right? And so this is kind of what the lady does. Even though Jesus has just really prophesied to her and told her all about her life, now she's like, well, what about this, right? And so Jesus says, look, at the end of the day, that stuff that you want to talk about is not going to matter. And then he gets to the bottom line. I am the Messiah. And that woman is so enamored with Jesus. She's so moved by that conversation. Maybe she was expecting an argument. Maybe she was expecting him to put her down or put her in her place. That's not what she got. She got an honest conversation with the Messiah. And when she left his presence, she didn't leave upset, angry, disappointed, hurt, feeling manipulated, feeling abused, feeling overlooked. She left his presence feeling seen acknowledged, respected. She left his presence with a sense of optimism, a sense that things were going to turn out okay. Things were going to be better than they had been. She left the presence of Jesus elated. She was so full from that conversation with Jesus that she ran into town and she began to tell everyone about this conversation she had with Jesus. He had fed her. Now she was going to go off and feed others. And it was going to be so attractive that it, the Bible says many in that town that very day were saved. They came to believe in Jesus as the Messiah. All because of that one conversation he had with that woman where he said, yeah, whatever stuff you want to bring me, whatever you want to argue about, whatever you want to debate, here's the bottom line. I am what you need. I have what you need. I am what you need. We don't need to have an argument. I see you. I love you. I'm not condemning you. I didn't come to beat you up. I am what you need. And she got it. She got it. And then she wanted to give it to other people. And it just always strikes me that people who come to Jesus, they always leave satisfied. Amen. They leave wanting more, not less. It's like having a wonderful meal. You might feel satisfied, and, but don't you then look forward to the next time you get to have that experience all over again because it was so good? That's how people leave the presence of Jesus. They're satisfied, and they want other people to be satisfied, and they want more, and they want more, and they want more. It's not a chore to have an interaction with Jesus. It's life and breath. It's living water. Yes. It's bread of life. I can't wait till I get to do it again. Amen. 
that's what it is. But have you noticed in church that that's not always what it is, right? Have you noticed in your own walk with the Lord that's not always what it is? Sometimes we kind of reduce all of that wonderful stuff to um, a ritual or a habit or a box to check. And we just, we know how to really suck the life out of life sometimes. When the truth is Jesus came that we could have life and life to the fullest, to the abundance, to the overflow. And, and the, the truth is many of us settle for far less than what Jesus would have us have, right? And so there's a pattern to being in the presence of the Lord being fed, many ways we can be fed by the Lord, right? I'm going to talk about that in a second. And then we're always going to end up having to feed someone else. I want to draw your attention to another story. And this is where Jesus has one of his final conversations with his disciple, Peter. And this is after Jesus has been resurrected. He comes back for that 40-day period. He's having conversations with people. He's appearing to people. And he has this conversation with Peter, and, and you may be familiar with it. He asks Peter this question, Peter, do you love me? And then what does Peter say? He says, Lord, you know I do. Yes. And then what's Jesus' response to Peter? Feed my sheep. And Jesus asks him this not once, not twice, but three times. All right, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know that I do. Feed my sheep. Three times we have this. And as someone who is responsible for feeding other people, this makes perfect sense to me. I cannot feed anyone until I have been fed. And so Jesus had spent lots of time, years, with his disciples. And during this time, Jesus was in charge of the feeding. He did the feeding. He fed his disciples. He set the example. He met the need. He did the miracle, right? And then there became a transition where Jesus said, now you do it. Now you do it. Now you do it. And then finally, it was going to be, now I'm going away. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, now it's on you. This job of feeding people, the living water, the bread of life. And that's really what it looks like to mature in our relationship with the Lord. At first, we are dependent upon maybe someone else to feed us from the word of God. That's fine. But as we get that appetite for the Lord, as we grow in our friendship and our relationship with him, there comes a point where we have to take the initiative to feed ourselves, right? That's what maturity is. And I'm looking around at a church where really, if you'll let me oversimplify it like this, we have two extremes on a spectrum. And on one side of the extreme, we've got people who have been fed for a long time, and they've been fed a good spiritual diet, and they have eaten well. They've eaten well. They know how to pull up to a table and eat from the Word of God and good preaching and prayer. They know how to do that, and they eat regularly. And they eat, and they eat, and they eat, and they keep eating. And they're so full, and they're so happy, and they're so stuffed, they're so satiated. And the one thing they have forgotten is that they got to figure out a way to feed some other people. They're just full, 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 but they're not feeding anyone. And that's on one extreme. And then we've got the other extreme of people coming into the kingdom of God and they're absolutely starving. They're just so spiritually malnourished. 
because they didn't have a godly mom and dad to feed them. Nobody had Bible time with them when they were growing up. They didn't have anyone to feed them spiritually, but somewhere along the way they heard about Jesus and they wanted to be a part of the kingdom of God, but they came in and they're just spiritually skin and bones. And they don't know how to feed themselves. So they look at people and they say, how are these people so fed? How are they so fat with God's word and God's presence? I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to feed myself. No one taught them. And so on both of these extremes, we see a problem with a diet. It's either out of balance or on one side or the other. And I'm, I'm really focusing today on those who are spiritually malnourished, sons and daughters who have no idea how to nurture, nourish, take care of themselves spiritually. They just don't know. And they're looking to us and saying, how do you do it? There's something parallel in physical starvation and spiritual starvation. I did a little bit of research and I found out that if your body starts to physically starve, be without food for a long time, or be without the right kind of food that will really nourish you and strengthen you for a long time, something will happen in your body and after a while your body will forget that it's hungry because it's been without food for so long that that hunger mechanism malfunctions and your brain forgets to tell you anymore that you're even hungry. So you can be starving and not feel hunger. That's what can happen in your physical body. And then if you start to look up symptoms of a, a person who's starving, the three most um, common number one, two, and three symptoms of a starving person are, one, they become apathetic, meaning they don't care. They lose their motivation to eat. They become, uh, I could eat, I couldn't, who cares, apathetic. Number two, they withdraw, isolation. And number three, this word, they become listless. That's just kind of a synonym for being without energy, without motivation. They're just kind of there, but they're just sort of existing without any kind of sense of purpose. And that's what happens to us physically when we're malnourished. Now apply that in a spiritual way. And that's what we see around us in the world today. People who are starving. And at some point, they don't even know they're starving anymore for God. They're not even hungry anymore for God. They can't even feel that hunger anymore. Then they have children. And they were so malnourished themselves that when they had children, they had no idea how to feed their own children, spiritually speaking. And so then they raise children who are also spiritually malnourished, and they don't even know how to feed themselves. They don't even know what they need. You know, a baby doesn't know what kind of diet they need. They don't know, and we don't beat them up for that. We expect it because of where they are developmentally. And yet we have people come into a church, and we, we expect them to know things that it's taken us 40 years to learn. They don't know what they don't know. And so the shame of it all and the thing that confounds us is that there's no shortage of spiritual food. There's no shortage of a Bible. There's no shortage of a church service. There's no shortage of online teaching and preaching, YouTube, podcast. There's no shortage of a Bible study. There's no shortage of books. There's no shortage of spiritual food, and yet people are starving. How do you explain that? Because just because you set this pretty table for me, and just because you put in the drink and you fill the plate with food and you set the table and you invite me to the table 
does not mean I have any idea what to do once I get here. I can pull up a seat to the table and I can watch everybody else eat and I can still feel like I have no idea how to do it myself. And what we want is for people to pull up to the table and eat, right? We want people to come on in, come on into church, pull up a chair. Here, we made this big spiritual feast for you. And they don't know how to pick up a fork. And we're like, here, this is what you do. You take the fork and you, and, but I can't do it for you. You got to pick up your fork. You got to pick up the fork and you got to put it in your mouth, right? You got to, I, I can tell you about the Lord. I can tell you about my relationship with him. I can tell you Bible stories. I can read you scripture. At some point, you got to open the book for yourself. At some point, you got to do it. And some people don't know that. And so what I want to encourage you to do today is if you're one of those people and you kind of feel like you got hung out to dry and you have no idea what you're supposed to be doing, I just want to share with you a little bit of what my week looks like with the Lord. Not because you have to do it like this at all, but I want to get very practical with you, okay? If you'll just let me be real practical, I think it'll help you, okay? Because there, I'm a creative person, and some of you are as well, and there's this myth that if you're a creative person, you don't like routine, you don't like discipline, you don't like order. That's a myth. That's not true. I'm a creative person, and I love routine. I like order. But what I have to have within those routines is creativity. I've got to have some flexibility within that routine. Does that make sense? So in other words, here's something that's part of my routine. I'm going to meet with the Lord at some point every day. And I'm usually going to do it in the morning because that's when I like to do it. So I'm going to do that. That's my routine. I have a relationship with the Lord, and I'm going to spend time with him every morning. But what that looks like is different every morning. Because if I had to do the same thing every morning and read the same translation of the Bible and do it for 20 minutes and then go to this, if it became just this rote thing for me, I would get so bored and I would quit and I would lose heart and I'd lose motivation. Now, if you're not a creative person and you love routine and you love sameness, God bless you. God made you that way. You do what works for you, right? You, that's fine. But there's this whole sea of people in the body of Christ, and we're bored stiff because we can't do the same thing every day. It'll drive us crazy, okay? And so within that routine, here's what happens. Sometimes on Monday morning, I wake up with a headache. Moms, has that ever happened to you, right? I wake up with a headache. If I wake up with a headache, which happens frequently... I'm not going to pull out a book and start reading because that hurts. I can't do it. It's uncomfortable. So if I wake up and I don't feel well or I have a headache or whatever, I'm not going to start my day reading from a book. I'm going to be kind to myself. And I'm going to pull up probably something on my phone that I can listen to. And so maybe I'm going to listen to some praise and worship music. And maybe I'm just going to meditate on the Lord. Maybe I'll sing. Maybe I won't. Maybe I'll just listen and worship. Maybe I'll take it easy, right? Or maybe I'll pull up something like there's a wonderful app called Dwell. And someone reads scripture in this app to music in the background. I like that. So I can listen to scripture with music in the background. It's not going to hurt my head, right? So that might be Monday. That might be my time with the Lord on Monday. Now, on Tuesday, I might wake up and feel great. So I'm going to get up and get dressed, and I'm going to go for a walk around my neighborhood. And while I walk around my neighborhood, I'm going to pray. I'm going to worship. I'm going to intercede for people. I'm going to do that job of an intercessor. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to walk that neighborhood and praise the Lord. I might listen to a podcast of somebody that I really like to listen to who's a good Bible teacher. And I've got three or four people that I listen to on a regular basis. I don't have 50 
15 or 20 people because honestly, I can't find 15 or 20 people that are really good Bible teachers, but I have three or four that I like, right? And so I'm going to listen to them teach the Word. Maybe on Wednesday, I'm going to get up and I'm going to get busy in this study that I've been doing because I'm really interested in getting deeper into the book of Romans. So on Wednesday, I'm going to pull out my Bible and my commentary and I'm going to dig into Romans chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. And maybe for 20 minutes, that's what I do. Do you see where I'm going with this? Every day is different. And that's what makes it exciting for me because when I wake up, guess what I get to do? I get to negotiate it with the Holy Spirit. I get to wake up and say, all right, Lord, what, what today? What's it going to be today? And he gets to have input in that. And I get to have input. And we work together in partnership. And this is what it looks like. And there's no um, monotony. And I don't dread it. And I'm not bored. I look forward to it because I don't know even what's coming the next day. I wake up. I don't know what today's going to be like. But I know I'm going to have time with the Lord. And it's going to be great. And if I start getting bored, I'll do something else. Do you know what I'm saying? You, you, you can have some input in this, and you can make it work for you in a way that just is life and breath to you. You don't have to do the same thing every day, okay? And so when we're talking about eating from the Lord's table, we're talking about some kind of Bible reading and Bible study because the Word of God is really powerful and really important. That's something you've got to have. And then we're talking about time in His presence. We're talking about praise and worship. We're talking about prayer, right? And we're talking about good teaching. We're talking also about community, where you get plugged into a community, a local church body. That way, you're not only being fed, but you've got some outlets where you can do some feeding, Amen. right? Yes. You don't have to wait till you're 50 years old to start feeding someone. You've got to get that... Um, routine going early on. I'm being fed and I'm feeding, right? I'm being fed and I'm a greeter. I'm being fed and I'm a nursery worker. I'm being fed and I'm volunteering at the after school program. I'm being fed and I'm an usher. Come on. Amen. You know you can do it. You know you can do it. Amen. Yes. What a privilege to walk with the Lord. What a privilege to be fed by Him and then to get to feed others. It's a get to. I get to. I don't have to, but I get to. So let me just leave you today with a Psalm 34, verse 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man or woman who trusts in him. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. That's what the woman at the well did. She had an encounter with Jesus and she found he was good. Listen, if you've had an encounter in church or with the Lord where you walked away feeling burned or feeling like God was not good, you need to try it again. Because when you encounter the real deal, the real presence of the Lord, you will not be disappointed. You will leave feeling like you were seen, you were loved, you are valued. Amen. You have purpose. God created you on purpose, with a purpose. Amen. You'll taste and see that God is good. He's not mean. Yes. It'll be like taking your first drink of water after being parched. Your first good meal after eating crackers for a week. That's how the Lord is. He's good. Amen. He's good. I want to pray for you as we close today, especially those of you who are feeling anxious or depressed or just unmotivated, just feeling that apathy, maybe that listlessness. Maybe you've become withdrawn. Let's take a look around. It, it could have something to do with your spiritual diet. And listen, I am not opposed to Netflix and chill. I mean, my husband and I love to chill out and watch a good show. That, I'm not against that at all. But listen, you can try and fill so, so, so many voids in your life with other kind of food other than spiritual food. And the thing is, 
Netflix is never going to be my primary food source. Amen. It's just never going to be because it, it, I'll leave feeling empty. Right. It'll distract me for a while, but it won't fill me. Right. Okay, can we go from being distracted to being full? We can do that in the church, right? And so it's a, it's a matter of what we mostly eat. We mostly eat. It's kind of like, right, you can have a little bit of sugar, yeah. right? Yeah. But you, you can't live on it. And, and to me, that's what those kind of things are. And I, I just want you to make sure that, hey, if you're going to sit down and binge watch a show, all right, but what's your primary diet? What are you really eating? What is really nourishing you? And what's really building you up? What's really maturing you, developing you, giving you a good appetite, a taste for good things? You can, you got to learn how to pick up the fork. And that's what I want to encourage you to do today. If you're a young mom, you can do it. If you're an older mom, you can do it. Father, I pray for the moms and dads, those of us who are responsible for feeding someone, primarily ourselves. Lord, you're a good shepherd, and you feed us, and you prepare a table for us in the presence even of our enemies. God, it's your will that we eat well. It's your will that we're full, that we have abundance. And Lord, I thank you that when we're able to gather together again in a church building, that we won't come starving. Yes, we will have missed each other. Yes, we'll be glad to see each other, but we won't be starving because we can come full. We can come full together. I pray, Lord, that you'd give people who've never really had a taste for you. I pray you'd touch their spiritual mouth. Amen. I pray you'd give them a taste for the things of God. I pray that you'd give them a, a hunger and a thirst. Wake it up, God, where it's kind of gone dormant and they can't really even feel their own hunger anymore. Wake them up. Wake up those taste buds and help them to crave pure spiritual milk, good food from your table, who you are, and to leave satisfied and to be excited and to think, you know what, I don't know what it's going to look like tomorrow, but I'm going to spend some time with the Lord tomorrow, and I can't wait to see what it is. I can't wait to see what he says. I can't wait to see what he shows me. I can't wait to worship him. I can't wait to just get in his presence and have that fullness of joy. So I do come against all kinds of anxiety and depression, but I pray, Father, that, that your people will learn to feed themselves from your table. Amen. And I bless them. I bless them in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. amen? amen. Well, have a great day. Have a good meal on Mother's Day. And uh, we love you. We can't wait to see you again. Thank you.